so excited that Linda Barry's here. I'm so happy to be here. I, um, I'm definitely a, a Canadian wannabe. You yeah. know, I've always, I grew up in Seattle and we were just really close to the border. And I've always had this kind of fantasy about Canada since I was a kid. So I'm always delighted when I'm here. Congrats on the Genius Grant, by the way. Isn't that crazy? How did you react when you got that? <laughs> well, you know what? I hung up on them seven times. What? Because I thought it was a robocall. And, you know, and I was kept getting these robocalls. And then I was doing that terrible thing you do where you answer and then go click because I thought it'll just stop whoever it is. And then I finally just turned my phone off. So it was, they were desperate <laughs> to try to find a way to contact me. And um, it took a long time for them to get a hold of me. And I ended up calling them. And, um, and then when they told me, it really, it, it's still sinking in because there wasn't, I had no warning. I had no indication that this was even in the works. And, um, but for me, the thing that happened immediately, and it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, I came from a really troubled household, but where I found my stability was in school. I was mm -hmm. like one of those kids that loved school. And the first thing I, it was like I saw a parade of all my teachers in my mind, and oh, now I'm getting all uh, emotional about it, but, and also my students. And it was just this feeling that, um, my getting this had everything to do with them and that that was it was so cool to think um that school really emerged at that point as my family in my mind and that that how wonderful it is that I get to teach oh, only as much as you want to but like well, what kind of household did you grow up in I grew up in a um I grew up in a household so my mom's from the Philippines and she came to the states when she was in her 20s and um she's the only one that married someone white um, I always say, if you see me, if anybody could see me, they'd see that I'm the color of a Band-Aid and I'm the, like, the whitest looking person in the world. And mm -hmm. I always tell people it's because I'm also a quarter Norwegian and Norwegian yeah. blood can suck the color out of anything. Yeah, you start to see the veins through the yeah. face, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. It's more translucent. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, my dad split pretty early on and the rest of the family um, emigrated. And so we grew up in a house that was had a lot of trouble and a lot of the kinds of troubles that immigrant families have. Um, and my mother wasn't a very um, happy person. She was a kind of a difficult person. So um, for the first, I don't know, until I was about 12, my grandmother from the Philippines was the person who kind of ran the household and was a jolly, really interesting person. I think I, I owe a lot to her. And then she left, and um, after she left, the house got really, really sad. But at that exact same time, I started. I found comics, mm -hmm. and um, where did and you, where did you find them? I well, I always loved comics. I loved the daily comics, like those really kind of terrible ones, Beetle Bailey and all yeah, that stuff. All yeah, all that. I right. loved those. Um, but uh, I was sitting in math class. I remember exactly. I was in row two. There was a kid sitting right across from me, and he had a copy of a comic called Zap, Zap Number Zero, and it was by R. Crumb, and. Um, I remember seeing it and just being galvanized, this idea that you could draw anything. That, uh, because in the, the, the daily papers, you know, normally are, are very, very tame. And the stuff that I saw in those, in that comic, just blew my mind. And so I started to copy um, his drawings, and I copied a lot of other drawings too, but his drawings in particular, and it, you know, he has a lot of, he had a lot of subject matter that actually frightened me when I was that age. I mean, a lot of sexual um, uh, stuff and just stuff that was too heavy for me. But he also just drew people on the street, and he drew, um, he had this one comic that really influenced me, and it, all it was was normal people on the street, and they'd get hit by a meatball that was like falling out of the sky, <laughs> and then they'd suddenly be enlightened, like they'd have this huge enlightenment, right. and it happened to every kind of person, you know, he had just like housewives, you know, poets with little berets on, everybody was getting hit by the meatball and then having this enlightenment, and I went crazy over it, or I'd see... Um, He'd draw a grocery store, and then you'd see a little sign. There'd be a sign for tomatoes and bananas, and then there'd be a little sign that would say, Men from Mars, 25 cents. Mm -hmm. And I went crazy over the idea that you could take the real world and transform it this way. So I feel like at that time, um, comics and, of course, music and art, those were the things that um, actually saved me. And I think what's interesting about human beings is that we really are born into a world that's full of characters. I mean, it's full of characters. And 
uh, kids get attached to characters really early on. They really understand characters. They fall in love with them. They get scared of them? They get scared of them, absolutely. They understand even at age four when a character does something out of character. They understand that. And so I think it's amazing that um, even if you're born into a really difficult circumstance, there's this world of characters that um, – you can become attached to and that can carry you through. Mm. Um, and so that that's what happened to me. And um, I feel like all my, my whole life happened um, mostly because I drew a picture. And so um, – and the whole reason I'm sitting here talking to you right now is because mm. I drew a picture. So I became really interested to uh, to find out if there was something I could do to give this – Thing yeah. to other people. I, I'm, I'm dying to talk about that. I'm dying to talk about like why we should, you know, essentially why this is important to you and what happens when we are told we're not artists and all these other things. But before we, before we get to that, I just mm-hmm. want to go back to something you were saying before, because you said like, you know, you're reading the, you're reading the paper and you saw the sort of the, in the comics in the paper and then you, you saw our crumb and kind of changed everything for you. But I did love this about you. I did find out that you're a you were a family circus oh, fan. My, oh, I'm a huge family circus fan. I uh, never would have thought, I don't know why, but. You know, you're sort of a legend of what they call alternative comics. I never thought you'd be a family circus. You know, it's funny because um, uh, I knew about reading before I could read. And I also knew about this idea about for the rest of your life. Um, And I remember looking at the paper because we didn't have books in the house, but we did get the daily paper. And so I got to see those. That's where I saw drawings. And um, I remember picking four comics that I was going to read for the rest of my life. And one of them was family – Family uh, Circus. So Family Circus is um, a a one-panel strip that's in a circle. And so much so that people sometimes call it Family Circle because they remember that circle part. And it's of a very happy household. Um, And before I could even read, I could just look through that porthole and kind of see these people who had this really good life. And the parents seemed to love the kids. They seemed to love each other. And I didn't, you know, I was too young to know that was corny. Um, And I loved it so much and it's always meant so much to me and uh, you know that thing that you hear when you're a young kid you hear a couple things one thing you hear is if you can hit the right note you can blow up a glass with your voice like opera singers remember how you'd see that in a commercial yeah. or, or I mean in a, in a comic yeah. and the other thing I heard is that when you see great art you burst into tears yeah. right and I always wanted to do that. I wanted to see great art and burst into tears, especially if there was somebody cute nearby and they'd look at me and go, oh, she's so deep. She's so sensitive. She's I, so I deep. must have her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I used to try to burst into tears. Um, but anyway, um, and I never was able to really pull it off. And I went to a, it was a National Cartoonist Society um, convention. And somebody said, Bill Keen was the artist, artist who drew um, – who drew Family Circus, but uh, his son, Jeff, who appears in the strip, Jeff, he um, now draws it. So somebody said, Linda, you like Family Circus, right? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, this is Jeff Keen. And I started bawling. Oh, wow. And it wasn't pretty. There was nothing that would make you want to go out with me. If you saw it, I was like drooling and yeah. shaking and moving toward him. And he started walking backwards like, what the hell is this? Yeah. You know, like yeah. who's coming toward Did he know me? you? Did he know? No. no. He just saw this chick like freaking out and coming toward him, you know. And, and um, But I realized that when I shook his hand, I had crossed through the circle. I, I had stepped on the other side of that oh, circle. My. I was actually touching him. And uh, – but it became the joke of the whole convention. They loved getting him within my line of sight because I burst into tears. And um, and it's still true that when we see each other, I start crying. But he did this amazing thing. Um, I uh, looked at the strip one day and I was in it. He drew me. What as were, what one were you of, doing? I was, um, I was with uh, Jeffy. And he was introducing me to daddy, say, and I was holding all my stuff and said something like, uh, she's my new best friend, even though she's a, she's a girl. It was something like that. But it was amazing to see myself drawn in this strip. You went through the portal. I did. You actually got through the portal. I did. That's amazing. I know. Oh, my God, man. <laughs> So yeah, my uh, my affection for family um, circus, and I've also gotten into you know like after a couple beers with a bunch of cartoonists, and they try to say something bad, like I'm almost willing to go to jail, like and just you know punch them. Um, so I really that strip really saved me, and I think it saved a, a, a lot of people. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with uh, Linda Barry. I got to do my reset here, by the way. This yeah. is the reset. Uh, the name of the show is Q. You're Linda Barry. You're a cartoonist, professor, teaching creativity. Your new book is called Making Comics. So. 
In this book, the book is mainly a bunch of exercises from a class he teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, just for, for people who don't know about the course, I mean, kind of myself included, when they were looking through a, one of those big kind of course catalogs, though, yeah. I'm sure they're all online now, but mm-hmm. you know, back when we would look through course catalogs, mm-hmm. what, what does this one say? This one is, it, it makes it um, very clear that, um, that people are welcome to be in the class um, whether they feel comfortable drawing or not that they don't have to be an art major to be part of the class. The thing that I try really hard is to get the most varied number of uh, kinds of people in the class. And it's first come, whoever can sign up first can be in it. There's no entrance. But the thing that everybody has to know is that it's a difficult class that people are going to have to work really hard. And what I love the most it's really rare at university to have people studying who are, have different majors to be studying next to each other. Very rare for freshmen to be studying right next to PhD students. And um, for people to feel comfortable drawing, studying next to people who don't feel comfortable drawing. But the people who don't feel comfortable drawing, like most people who gave up drawing, did it at about the age of eight or nine when they realized they couldn't draw a nose. Nose or hands, right? It's the nose, or yeah. The nose hands or hands. Were always, my hands yeah. were always. I, I used to draw a sleeve, right, and have the fingers just coming out. It was the best I could do. But you know what? In comics, that's fantastic because comics leap over that problem of representational work. You would not want to see Charlie Brown or Bart Simpson with a hyper realistic nose and hands. I mean, horrifying, <laughs> yeah, terrifying, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so in a funny way, comics take advantage of a basic human ability and need to recognize upright faces um, and recognize the mood of somebody and also upright bodies and, interestingly enough, what what hands are doing. So these things all put together, like, give us a really rapid picture of what mood somebody's in, how we're going to feel about them, how they're feeling toward us. And so comics take advantage of that. And there, um, anyone who can write the alphabet and um, our uh, numerals from um, zero through nine um, can make comics. And I would argue that those things are comics, that uh, there's a reason we call the letters of the alphabet characters. And when people are learning to write the alphabet, they're actually learning to draw. There's this point when the drawing process becomes writing, or people call it writing. But up until then, it's drawing. Mm. I, I read that you were a little hesitant to do the course. I was because... Because um, it's funny to me, because you seem so... Seems like it's just your bag, man. Like it just seems like exactly what you should be doing. It well, I I have always had great success teaching teaching writing, um, and I was never hesitant about teaching writing. But I was worried about teaching comics mostly because my own style. I never developed that really fast, rapid, you know, at ease cartoonist style. Um, for me, when I draw it. As a, it's sometimes as if I've never drawn before. I, I feel like I go through the same struggles a lot of people go through. I've just learned how to just do it. Yeah. Um, and so I was worried that um, that people were going to look at my drawing and go, well, this is what happens. I live in a, a rural community in, in Wisconsin. And um, when people occasionally find out um, that I'm a cartoonist, they're super excited. They th- want me to draw Garfield or something. And then they see my drawing, and the, you can see this shadow of pity c- kind of cross their <laughs> eyes. And it's sort of like, well, you know, everyone has a dream, and that's yours. And you follow that, even though it's kind of late. But you can just and see And you it. call the MacArthur people and say, will you talk <laughs> will to you Susan here? <laughs> will you tell her, for God's sake, what I did? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but the, but it turns out that my drawing style also um, seems to welcome. Uh, I mean, for people who don't draw or, or want to start drawing, they look at my drawing and say, "Well, dang, I can do it. If, that, if that's all I have to do, I can do it." And and the truth is, yeah, that's right. And isn't that great? What happens to us? I know maybe this is a bigger question, but I think about this a lot because on this show, I get to talk to a lot of artists, and the way I, I try to think about doing this kind of job is that you know, I think in the '80s and the '90s, and even in the 2000s, there was a lot of like, "Oh, he's the god of blah blah blah," or like, "She's the goddess of rock," or whatever like that, and it drives me mental, mental, and I'm not entirely sure why. I wanted to get your opinion on this. What, what, what happens when we start referring to artists as gods and legends and, you know, like apotheosis, they call it, turning them into supernatural beings, right? Well, I wonder if it's getting back to that thing of being born into a world of characters that you need. And when you do find someone who can sing a song in your eighth grade, you're yeah. in the grade eight or whatever, and your life is terrible, and this song comes on and suddenly you just feel alive and connected— 
that's a little god that yeah, feels a yeah, little yeah, godlike yeah. so i do feel like it's a, a natural it's almost like a huge the, the, what's the deepest gratitude right but on the other hand then it I, I know what drives you crazy about it i do know what drives you crazy about it but i do think that there is this feeling of immense gratitude um, I think it's one of the reasons why Star Wars, even I work with four-year-olds at the university, and for them, Star Wars is this huge, huge mm-hmm. thing. I think that there's this, you know, like I have deep gratitude toward all Wookiees and Chewbacca in particular. <laughs> um, <laughs> in particular, and Chewbacca and I have this, I haven't met Chewbacca, but I will, I hope. You're Wookiee agnostic. You're I, like, all Wookiees are great, but Chewbacca has a special place in the heart. Uh, I'm understand. a Chewbacca You ever meet Peter Mayhew, the guy? No, and I I wouldn't want to because he's not actually Chewbacca. He's yeah. he's the one that moves Chewbacca around. Yeah. Um. But uh, so I I think that there is that natural thing to deify uh those that 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 cause some g- important good change in in us. But but my my feeling is and I, I definitely hear what you're saying. My feeling is is when I, I felt this a lot when I read your book is that it keeps you from doing it. I just want I want oh yeah I want you to I want people to pick up a guitar and strum it. Yes. I want people to sit down and draw a picture. Yeah, I yeah. want people to sing. Yeah. And not to think that it's only for... Exactly. And there is this feeling um, up until... You know, it's interesting how soon people give up. Like, I remember... It was on the radio. I remember, you know, like being in the back of the car and there was somebody on the radio saying, you know, concert pianists, if you'd like to really play the piano, you must begin before the age of four. And, you know, I'm 12 sitting in the back seat and going... There you go. Damn, you know, or if you want <laughs> to be a ballet boat. dancer, it has to be by age three. It's like, damn. <laughs> and by the time you're 12, you're washed up, right? You already know what you're good at mm-hmm. and what you're not good at. And there's this feeling um, for us that unless we're really, really good at something, we don't have the right to do it, which I think is sort of like saying, if you, unless you can ride a bike like Lance Armstrong, you can't ride a bike. And mm-hmm. it turns out not even Lance Armstrong could ride a bike <laughs> like Lance Armstrong, you know. So there's a so there's a performative work, but then there's this other thing um, that's interesting. And one of the cases I make for this thing that we call the arts, I always call it this thing we call the arts because it, it was there before we had that name for it, um, is that... Um, Oh, now I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, I was thinking about Lance Armstrong. Oh, I know what it is. It's that every little kid um, who's, uh, nobody has to teach them to do any of those things, um, to uh, to draw or to make stories or to dance. And I believe that this one of the basic tenets of um, evolution is that things that contribute to our survival tend to persist. Art persists. Mm-hmm. Art persists, and it doesn't just persist um, as adults when we look at it as a performance thing, but it's in every little kid. And in fact, if it's not in them, if we have a four-year-old that's scared to draw, we worry about them. Mm-hmm. But then if they're 40 and they're scared to draw, it's like, yeah, me too, man. Mm-hmm. You know. So I'm interested in what happens and if I can communicate that drawing can be something else, just like there are all kinds of alcoholic drinks and all kinds of music. Um, there is all kinds of drawings um, you, as well. Do you remember the last time you came on here and we drew together? Do you have a recollection of that? I yes, still have I it do. at home, by the way. I'm so happy. I framed it and everything. I'm so Both happy. Both of ours, by the way. I'm so happy. In a, in a real arrogant move on my part. No, I was like, no. I'm going to do it too. No, that's great. But, it's, a, it's a record of how our hands moved on that day. We drew. We drew a... A cowboy smoking a cigarette. Yes. Because uh, that's what my dad did. It's the only thing I knew how to draw. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to do another kind of exercise today. Sure. Sound good? Uh-huh. All right. So my producer, Vanessa, has given each, us each an envelope with a shape in it. Uh, this is sealed. I haven't seen the shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's going to put on a minute and a half of music. In that time, we have to use that shape to draw a self-portrait of ourselves dancing. Am I right about that, Vanessa? All right. I love it. You want to do it? Yeah, yeah. All right. This is you. <laughs> and the, do you, oh, I got this. Do you want a marker? Um, oh, yeah, I can use a marker. What one do you want? A black one or a blue a one? A black one. Well, you can have both if you want one. Yeah, okay? black one. You're Linda good. Berry. Um, Let me see the tip on this. All right. So yeah, we, that's good. Vanessa, do you want us to count it down and then we start drawing? All right. 90 seconds. Three. Got the music ready? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Are we down? Are we good? <laughs> can we hold them up? All right. Let's ready? What I, what is, let's like, oh, yours is so cool. No, yours is good. Oh, look at yours you, Yours is dude. so cool. Let's dance. Da, da, da. Oh, yours is 
Badass, so man. Is That's yours. so cool. I wish I had thought of the of the disco ball. Can I be honest with you? While I was drawing it, I started with a stick figure because uh-huh. I was like, oh, you know what? I should just do a stick figure. It's easy to do. And I said, Linda's here. The whole time we've been talking about how I should, you know, the hands aren't going to be, look, see, my hands are funny, right? Yeah, but the, but the thing is, human beings are set up so that anything that's in the hand position or the feet position are going to read as hands and feet. Right. And again, that's comics. And um, I started, when I was drawing mine, I realized I was drawing a head way too big. And I thought, how am I going to s- just squinch my body in there? But I started laughing. That's the thing that cracks me up about doing this is this feeling of being a little out of control. It's like being on a sled. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, that alone is worth it. Like, just the idea that all we did was wiggle um, a, f- a felt pen on a piece of paper for 90 seconds, and your mood is transformed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to go on the street to try to buy drugs that would do that for me. <laughs> and I didn't know I just could take a Sharpie and draw, you know, on a, on a piece of paper. So if you're listening to this right now and you, and you yourself stopped drawing hands when you were eight years old or you yourself stopped singing when you were eight years old, Try it out. Yeah. Well, the thing is, um, that's another reason I like working with four-year-olds because four-year-olds figure out systems for stuff. So I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, my university students are are frightened of uh, drawing hands. And the kids will go, oh, that. just tell them it's easy. It's just snowball, thumb, 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 thumb. Oh. Yeah. Or, they'll, or, or I'll tell them another difficulty is ears. And they'll say, oh, it's easy. It's the letter C with a question mark in it. Yeah, like a seagull is an M. Right? See? Yeah. All so they right, have man. they have all these. They have. By the way, imagine if you went, no, don't, no. No, a no. sequel is not an M. <laughs> now, I don't know where you got that idea. <laughs> I love this drawing, by the way. I have a crush on it. Oh, I'm glad you like it. You know what I find interesting? And I know we got to wrap it. Like, you know what I find interesting is when I drew it, it wasn't in the last five seconds that I went, oh, sh- shoot. Oh, sugar. I have a beard. Yeah. When I draw myself, I draw myself without a beard. Yeah. Um, I wish I should draw a beard on me. I mean, yeah. as long as if I want to be a really hairy Wookiee chick, there, I should be able to just do it in comics. You should be. I a- did. I would. I actually did. A, one, one semester, I was Professor Chewbacca. I changed my name every semester. I was Professor Sputnik last time. What, what are you this year? Um, no, th- la- I'm on sabbatical, oh, so I'm right. Professor Freeball. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm free, free balling. <laughs> Linda Berry, come back once a year, will you? I want to. I want to. I just kind of want to live in a corner of this beautiful room and you, just see what's going on here. If you want to be Canadian, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to make that you work. You have no and more than ever. <laughs> if you want to see, uh, if you got a marriage proposal from in there already, if you want to see uh, the, the the pictures that Linda and I drew, you can go to our website, cbc.ca/slash q. That rhymed. All right. Linda Berry's new book is called Making Comics. It's out now. Right on.